We mostly see the automobiles moving around the road, but we hardly know who are the people behind. So today we have somebody who has put in his brain behind development and design of various such automobiles. Mr. Warren Harris, uh, CEO and Managing Director of Tata Technology is with us to discuss how the technology and design scenario is, is uh, uh, progressing. Uh, welcome to ET Auto. How do you look at you know, uh, design landscape in Indian automotive industry? You have been supporting to component industry also. How do you rate the t in terms of design? Because Indian component makers especially not were so equipped with design, how it has changed. In well, the, the market here um, is growing exponentially. Um, the, uh, the amount of engineering work that's being done here in India is touted to, uh, to double between 2014 and, uh, and 2020. And I think that's a testament uh, to the experience and the, uh, the breadth and depth of the capabilities that's growing here in India. And, uh, and the engineering work that's being done here is not just for Indian uh, OEMs. It's all for, also for OEMs uh, around the world. And so the capabilities uh, and the trust that is extended to the Indian engineer now is, uh, is, is something that is, is supporting not just the indigenous industry, but the global automotive industry around the world. So you have over 6,000 engineers in India working. Can you give us an idea of what are they doing, which are the major brands they are working for, and which are the big cars or you can say popular models that you have supported so far? We're, we're working with, um, with all of the, um, the top 15 uh, automotive OEMs and most of the, uh, the tier ones and many of the tier twos. And there's really two components of our value chain. Uh, one, we do real um, product development work. So we, we design uh, complete vehicles, we design uh, components. But we also complement that with um, a capability that we have on the technology and the IT side of things. And that has two roles. One, it helps the manufacturing companies that we work with on the engineering side of things select and deploy the technology on which uh, new products are built. But increasingly, as tech and uh, the automotive product is coming together, we're providing solutions in and around connected car and, uh, and autonomous driving. So you are the company which, uh, you know, really prepared the future of automobile industry. Uh, you start the work much in advance. So how uh, we have seen a lot of disruption coming up in automotive industry, especially uh, we are hoping to have all electric fleet by 2013. Uh, how much a buzz are you looking at in the back room of automotive industry? What is actually happening? How, how much of seriousness do you see in this direction? Well, I, the, uh, there's a tremendous amount of buzz. We've recently opened our European Innovation and Development Center in, uh, in Warwick in, uh, in the UK. And we had Dr. Ralph Speth, the, uh, the chief executive of, uh, of Jaguar and Land Rover, come and speak uh, at that particular event. And, uh, and he positioned that in the next five years, he believes there will be more disruption than there has been in the last 30 to 40 years in the automotive industry. And, uh, and, and the disruption is real. And it's not just from the perspective of the product. Um, there is obviously from a product perspective, there's the move to alternative propulsion systems. There's the move to connected vehicles. There's the move to um, um, autonomous uh, vehicles. So we're seeing the product evolve, but we're also seeing the value chain and the business model evolve. Uh, the ownership model is now being changed challenged by uh, ride share and car share uh, capabilities. The whole way in which uh, an OEM will monetize the investment in products are being looked at differently uh, in the future than they are at the moment. So there's a tremendous amount of excitement and a tremendous amount of uh, trepidation in some areas in terms of what that will mean for the OEMs themselves, what that will mean also for their suppliers and also their dealers. So you talked about mega trends such as ride sharing and electric vehicle. Uh, looking at the overall OEM, where the uh, major focus is going to be and how the companies are ready to take on these challenges because this will finally come as challenge also because will there will be new players also coming up rather than traditional OEMs. So do you see more of new players also coming up and how uh, the traditional players are ready to cope up with this challenge? Uh, a, a great question and uh, and I, I think for, from, um, from the, the insight that we have 
Um, we we intersect with a number of the uh, of the the major trends. One is uh, alternative propulsion systems. So the 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 move away from a conventional conventional internal combustion engine to electric vehicles, um, plug-in hybrids, and uh, and even. Um, um, hydrogen cells. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of investment being made in that, and uh, and that is 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 um, is precipitating not just an investment in the propulsion system itself, but also in the uh, in the in the vehicle architecture. Um, the essential condition for a an alternative propulsion system is a lightweight vehicle, and so there's a lot of investment that's being put into uh, lightweighting. And again, that's one of the areas that we're playing a, uh, a an increasingly larger role uh, for um, uh, OEMs and their and their supply chains. In, in terms of of, of new entrants uh, to to the question. That you uh, you asked, we're seeing a, a lot of um, uh, organisations uh, come in uh, to the West Coast in the United States and and also in China, and uh, and the perspective that they're bringing to the market is slightly different different to the traditional uh, OEM. Uh, what they are typically looking at is the is the connected experience, taking the connected experience that you have in the home or at uh, at work and making that available. Um, when you're moving from one place to another in uh, in a in a in a car or, or an SUV, and uh, and so what we're seeing with those types of organisations is that their focus in terms of what the the DNA of their brand is going to be is very different than the focus that a traditional uh, OEM uh, would so have. So Tata Technology is a very strong partner when it comes to connected vehicle. We'll talk about that, but before that. Uh, let's just look at the automotive landscape when, you know, uh, Tesla has become more valued company when it comes to revenue than uh, Ford. Uh, how do you read this kind of development? Do you think the more of startups will come in and uh, take this space away as the uh, entire, you know, market and the business for I, I, uh, I, I struggle to understand a little bit that um, uh, an organization like uh, Tesla uh, that has not even uh, delivered, I think, 750,000 units yet and has not made a profit. Uh, I struggle to understand how that can attract a valuation that's bigger not only than Ford but also than, uh, than General Motors. General Motors uh, delivers over 9 million units a year and has done that very profitably and since it uh, emerged from bankruptcy in, uh, in 2009. So uh, I, I don't necessarily want to talk about the, the valuations today, but uh, what I would say is that the, the market cap uh, of a Tesla I think is a testament to the belief that the financial markets have that the market is going to disrupt and the value chain is going to be very different in the future than it is today and the ability to be able to monetize that value chain will in part be driven by the most innovative companies and Tesla has demonstrated uh, consistently that it is, if nothing else, a very innovative company. So can you say that this uh, uh, Tesla uh, that has cap happened in terms of market capitalization, do you think this kind of trend is going to continue? Like look at Google, they have also started, you know, uh, uh, making a lot of buzz around autonomous car and the uh, automobile industry they are trying to entrench into. So do you think that the software company uh, trying to make a space in hardware space uh, companies like we have other like uh, Suzuki or GM or Ford how do you look at yeah, the I overall think, landscape? Uh, I, I, again I think it's a, it's a great question. I, I think if, if you look at the landscape going forward uh, there's going to be a, a market for product uh, there's going to be a market for the technology that informs the user experience and there's also going to be a market for the data that is uh, is produced or consumed uh, by the vehicle itself. I, I was at a conference recently and, uh, and uh, I was sat next to the controller of a radio station and, uh, and he was talking about buying in the future uh, data from the OEMs with regard to which radio stations um, the user was was tapping into. So that's just an, an example of how an OEM in the future will be able to monetize the investment that they're going to put in, into the product. So there's no question 
that there's a, a tremendous amount of disruption that's coming and that will provide a challenge to some players but also opportunities for others. So even like traditional players Ford, you know, Ford's one pickup has more coding than many, you know, aircrafts also. So how they, these, the changing scenario is really, you know, doesn't look like a, as we used to have. So do you think the software companies and the demarcation of software company and the automobile major will change and the uh, things will submerge when we are using more of electronics, more of software in the I, I think I think there's no question that that will happen. And I, and I think when you look at mobility in its, uh, in its broadest sense and you start to include uh, car share and, and ride share as well as the uh, apps that will define the user experience in a in a vehicle uh, the communications players will play a significant role the technology players um, uh, chip companies like nvidia uh, will play a uh, a very important role going forward and and where the center of gravity um, uh, is in uh, in five to ten years will be fundamentally different than where it is today um, and, uh, and certainly the OEMs will argue that they will continue to hold sway. The technology companies are, uh, are challenging that. So it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. So currently we have over 30, 32,000 components coming in and being fit in one passenger vehicle or car. Uh, there are a lot of suppliers, you know, uh, their business is dependent on the current scenario of uh, how vehicles are made, how they are produced, what kind of parts are there. Ten years down the line, how do you think this uh, scenario is going to change for suppliers? And how do they be prepared? You know? How should they prepare themselves to be future ready? And what should be their focus? Because you come uh, from a company which has been guiding these component makers as well. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the dialogue that we're having with our clients in the supply chain um, is um, is 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 very much a, a dialogue that is um, is driven by the concern that they've got in and around uh, the disruption that is going on to the technology and to the subsystems that they are responsible for. Um, but uh, I, I think that there is a, a level of pragmatism that is is currently embraced by the supply chain. In that, you know, you take electric vehicles. Uh, electric vehicles today when you look at the world uh, market, is less than 1% of the overall market. In 10 years' time, if that grows to 5, 6, 10%, there's still a, uh, a lot of the, the market that is going to be still driven by a conventional proposition. And so I, I think that the uh, supply chain is going to need to continue to invest in new technologies. But there's also going to be, I think, for an extended period, a market for their existing uh, products or an evolution of their existing products. So, so we see that there's one uh, core focus for the industry, the countries also, that they want to focus mostly on electric vehicle. Look at France, they're talking about all electric fleet by 2040. India is also talking about all electric fleet by 2030. Uh, do you think that will be really that dependent only on electric vehicle when uh, in countries like India, the production of electricity itself is not that clean. So do you think IC engine and gasoline all, uh, you know, and diesel powered engine is going to die? And how do you look at uh, the overall scenario, you know? I, I, I think that there is, is, is certainly change that's going to take place. Um, but I, I think that the change that is dependent upon government regulation uh, always takes an awful lot longer than that uh, than we anticipate. Uh, if you look at the seatbelt, for instance, the seatbelt was uh, was designed and and uh, and, uh, and patented um, in the 50s, and uh, and regulation um, did not catch up until the 80s and the 90s, and 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 so uh, I suspect. Uh, that the uh, the lofty ambitions that are being espoused at the moment by France and the UK and India, uh, I, I, I think that um, it, it's likely that they're not going to be realized. Now, um, um, territories like China are, are taking a much more ag aggressive um, um, position on, on EVs, the government is. And so uh, I think there's, uh, there's likely to, to be more change 
uh, in in China, given the way that um, that regulation and uh, and and policy is enacted, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, democracies like um, France India, and yeah. India and uh, the United States or the UK. But to looking at China, you know, we have seen very rapid electrification of fleet there in China. What are the a uh, key area that has helped, you know, apart from policy, if we talk about, has there been cost-effective vehicles also? That well, I think there's a, there's a realization in China when you look at vehicle penetration rates. Um, for every thousand people, there's only about 80 vehicles. There's a realization that if China was ever to catch up with the United States, which has 800 vehicles to every thousand people, that there's not enough oil being produced to be able to satisfy that particular demand. So there's a realization by the industry and by the government that they need to do something different. And so I think there's a convergence of thinking in and around electric vehicles. And, uh, and I think that that convergence is what is driving the accelerated pace. What you're also seeing is that the electric vehicle space is attracting a lot of capital and a lot of um, uh, thought leadership uh, from the technology space. Most of the new uh, electric vehicle companies in China, uh, the promoters are uh, internet billionaires. And so uh, there's, there's a lot of, of fresh thinking, uh, a lot of, of uh, technology platforms that are informing the new products. And so it's not just a, uh, it's not just a propulsion play, it's a, it's a complete disruption of, of the proposition, of the vehicle proposition that is being undertaken in China. We have seen a lot of pressure on vehicle manufacturers when it comes to price. So uh, this has led to you know similar kind of component and design being used for multiple models. Do you think this has been one of the reasons why there has been a lot of recalls of late? Um, I, I, I don't, but just to pick up on, on the question, you know, this is, this is one of the things that I think India does better than anywhere else in the world. Um, the, the ability uh, of an Indian engineer uh, to develop a, a frugal uh, product um, is, uh, is better than, uh, than what we can do in Europe and what we can do in, in the United States. And so I, I think the, the Indian market will continue to be a hub for um, the reduction of cost um, around the piece price of a vehicle. And I think you'll, see, you'll continue to see a lot of frugal uh, innovation coming out of India that will inform product not just here for the Indian market, but, um, but products all over the world. So last question, Tata Technology already has 6,000 engineers working here. We see a lot of disruption happening in the automotive space, which contribute 70 percent to your uh, revenue so it becomes so uh, because you need to be ready for future changes you need to put a lot of design thing a lot of customer are going to come how are you looking at expanding yourself in India how many more engineers we expect to? well we, we're um, our, our top line growth at the moment um, our uh, compound annual growth rate is uh, is about 13 14 percent we've uh, recently brought in a new investor Walbo Pincus is uh, has come into our organization and the business plan that has under pin that investment will see us um, uh, accelerate our growth to about 15 16 percent over the next uh, three to five years so uh, within five years we're going to double the size of our organization so the eight and a half thousand engineers that we have we anticipate we're going to need close to uh, 20,000 by 2021 2022 and and many of those engineers uh, will come with the new skill sets and the new capabilities that will be required of the automotive industry. So we'll be balancing the ongoing investment in mechanical skills with technology skills and, uh, and with the type of, uh, of connectivity solutions that will provide support for autonomous driving and connected cars. How much you expect to invest and uh, how much do you look at your revenue? Currently your revenue is around $420 million. So how do you look at it going forward by 2020 when you want to double your workforce? Well, we, we, we continue to invest in infrastructure, we continue to invest in skills, we continue to invest in, uh, in IP. Um, the, the percentage of revenue that that represents will continue uh, to, to, to be supported in our future business plans. So uh, we're not seeing that we are going to need to accelerate or extend the, uh, the level of investment. It will just keep pace with the, uh, the growth that we're uh, anticipating for the company. Thank you so much for talking to us, Warren. Thank you.